Great. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be back at this course again this year. So I've been charged with discussing the unique aspects of the elite athlete. So we have to figure out what we're actually talking about here. Are we talking about an Olympic athlete, a professional? Is this a multi-million dollar actor training for a karate role? Is this the, as, the, as Cliff said, the mom coming in with the fastest 16-year-old running back in Central Texas? The problem with that is, is that oftentimes that may end up being an elite athlete, as the list here would suggest uh, with these NFL future and present Hall of Famers. Or is it your Smith and Nephew rep, who is Blaine Irby for me, this guy's in my OR, and former tight end for Texas. So I, for today's discussion, we're going to limit this to the folks that are either collegiate level or above and spend the majority, if not all, of their uh, time preparing for their sport. So what's unique about these patients? Well, they're highly and well-trained, obviously. They're in their peak physical form, but they have desire, much more so than your recreational athlete. They have accomplished goals. They have a desire to get better. They have a desire to uh, get over the hump on this new injury, almost to their detriment. And so sometimes you have to slow them down a bit and control that desire and funnel it in the right direction. They want to blast through physical therapy protocols that are often in, in place to, uh, to help improve their recovery. They often have an entourage, and so you'll see a trainer and a physical therapist and their agent and GM and acupuncturist and massage therapist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to manage this team because they're all there to be helpful. And they're oftentimes, in contrast to the patient who comes in with nine months of pain uh, and is the, does nothing but run and never cross trains and has a consistent hip deconditioning, these patients don't necessarily have that. And so oftentimes, they are able to comply with and uh, participate in an accelerated rehab or an intense rehab as they can devote more time to it post-operatively. So the important part of this initially and from a preoperative standpoint is you want to identify their sport. You want to find out what are the forces at work here and what's normal for their hips. So tennis, baseball, CrossFit, football, they all have different mechanics and unique aspects to it. So Ellen Becker looked at uh, tennis and baseball players, and these are overhead athletes that <clears throat> have compensatory rotation changes in their dominant arms. So increased external rotation uh, and increased internal, excuse me, and decreased internal rotation oftentimes in their dominant arm. Well, so they looked at, well, does, does this apply to the hip? And it turns out that there's no statistically significant side-to-side -side difference, meaning that there's no compensatory change in rotation. So when one of these patients presents with asymmetry, just like a standard recreational athlete, on their symptomatic side, it warrants further testing. It's not normal. And then Harris looked at the Houston Ballet Company, one of the most elite ballet companies in the world, and, and looked at radiographic evaluation. And it turns out 89%, unsurprisingly, had dysplasia or borderline dysplasia, 92% of females. And of the ones that had dysplasia, 92% of the women had it bilaterally, and 82% of the men had it bilaterally. It's oftentimes these genetic predispositions that get them to this spot. Their increase femoral neck antiversion, their global ligamentous laxity, their dysplasia allows them range of motion that I could never dream of, which is why they're in the ballet company. So <clears throat> Gerhardt looked at uh, soccer players, so male and female soccer players playing in the professional level radiographically. And in contrast to the ballet population where their genetic predisposition probably puts them there uh, from a bony standpoint, these players probably have these bony abnormalities because they developed them in their peak growth years. So Dr. Laprade and Dr. Philippon have looked at peewee hockey players and virtually none of the 13-year-olds have uh, cam and pincer lesions and labral tears. And then 18-year-olds, almost the entire team does. So something happens in that peak growth year that leads to that. So when you look at these players who have been playing all their life, 72% of male and 50% of female athletes had femoral tabular impingement findings on x-ray, mostly cam lesions, and a lot of them had it bilaterally. So <clears throat> others have looked at, uh, well, what are the mechanisms of this? Well, it's the sprint start in hockey. And then Whiteside looked at 14 elite hockey goaltenders, specifically evaluating skating, stopping, butterfly saves, and then the recovery movements coming from that. And it's an actuality, and I would have thought of it in the butterfly goalie, it would have been the butterfly movement that did it, but it was the skate stop, it's the hockey stop, that produced the most internal rotation, which is actually applicable to all hockey players. So their conclusion was is that your resection really should be focused on improving internal rotation. And how many folks 
continuously, every time they perform a dynamic hip exam, take the hip out and internally rotate them to maximal rotation. I can't tell you how important that is. And if you don't address that in a hockey player, you're going to under resect their bony abnormality. So if you don't know the sport well, ask and observe. Go, watch, listen, talk to them about what they do. And there, I had a, a collegiate swimmer who uh, uh, swam butterfly, and I thought, well, golly, there's not a lot of hip rotation in that. And then she said, oh, no, it's my flip turn where it bothers me, where she's curled up in a ball before she explodes, and that was that deep flexion that got her. And so you need to discuss expectations with these patients preoperatively. You know, are they at the end of the career? Are they at the beginning? Are they just looking for a good hip to get them the rest of their life, or are they trying to return to play in, in, in their peak time and in peak performance? So you also want to find out how did this occur initially? Was this an acute traumatic thing or a chronic overuse entity? And don't forget that it's been described long ago that lateral impact, so the, the football player who lands on his side has a high incidence of cartilage shear injury. And so you can pr more predictably uh, consult with him about the potential need for microfracture uh, prior to surgery. And then you want to talk, as I mentioned with the swimmer, about specific motions that exacerbate the symptoms. So in the ballet dancer, is it, the, is it the hyperabduction or the hockey player, the internal rotation? And this should guide your resection and more specifically guide your dynamic exam. So remember that, that, that FAI is a dynamic process. You can have a huge cam and impinge sitting at a desk, uh, or you can have a small cam that's uh, very lateral and impinge only in 90 degrees of abduction when you're doing the splits. And so that dynamic process, you have to identify preoperatively and then evaluate it intraoperatively to make sure that you get your resection accurate. And then you don't forget the extraarticular pathology. If you look at uh, um, epidemiological and longitudinal studies in, in NHL and NFL, these are much more common than intraarticular pathology. Adductor and rectus strains, core muscle injury uh, need to be addressed uh, preoperatively uh, either through rehab or, um, uh, or other means. And, uh, and then I rely a lot on a diagnostic injection. So we have a collegiate rower who came in with, had seen three providers and uh, had a labral tear that was not seen on an MRI. And this kind of goes along with um, uh, the 24% false negative rate commonly seen with uh, MRIs with respect to labral tears. And her exam was consistent, I thought, with an intraarticular pathology, but the key was a, a little bit of lidocaine. We had her go out and uh, row first on an ERG machine, anger her hip, come in, we did the injection, and had her go back and row again. And it really was only rowing that bothered her, and then she had 90% pain improvement. And so that said, gosh, here's the problem. And we go and we address it, and it turns out she has a labral tear at the time of surgery, and you make her better. So as you've heard before all day today, preoperative diagnostic injection can be exceptionally helpful.